So this is the second year that we're going to have a Lenten Recollection sponsored by our class. And um, we hope that uh, this particular Lenten Recollection will help us uh, in our journey to, so that Jesus will light our path as we go on with our life. For the opening prayers, may I call on Dr. Chari the Rosario, one of our classmates. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, 
we bow down in awe and worship of your real and divine presence here in our midst. As we acknowledge and proclaim you as our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our fortress and strength, the King of all the universe, the source of all our blessings, and the very reason for our being. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for the many times we have been remiss of our duties towards you, towards others, and towards ourselves. Grant us the wisdom to do what is only right and most pleasing to you, as we offer to you all that we are, all that we have, and all that we can do for your greater honor and glory. We thank you likewise, O oh Lord, for the trials and challenges that come into our lives as we, as we unite them with your sufferings and death on Calvary for the forgiveness of sins. Touch all those who are suffering from calamities, from natural, from wars, and from any illness of body, mind, and spirit. Restore them to their normal health and strength. Keep them in your tight embrace, O Lord, that they may not lose their faith, hope, and trust in you. Fill the world with your love, your peace, and your joy. Bless our church and world leaders that they may do their utmost best to foster peace and harmony among all nations. We pray most especially for the speedy and peaceful resolution of the Ukraine-Russia crisis and all other conflicts. Likewise, Lord, for the healing of the sick and eternal repose of all the souls in purgatory who have died in your grace. Spare us from this uh, pandemic, our loved ones as well, from any calamity or catastrophe, from any malignant, lingering, or debilitating illness, and from anything that may separate us from you. Protect our children and keep them safe, O oh Lord, including the unborn babies we have spiritually adopted. Spare them from being aborted. All of this we ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, Mama Mary, in union with the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, at every Eucharist, the priest whispers, do this in memory of me. Memory. Memory is a gift. It is a gift that only God can give. When we get sick and lose our memory, it is a terrible situation. When we lose our memory because we choose to forget and we become ungrateful about the past, that would be a very tragic life. Memory is God's gift to us. And when God wanted to show us the depth of His love, He told us, do this in memory of me. Because when you remember what I did, when you remember what I said, when you remember how I lived, I will be there among you in the midst of you. I'd like to invite you to reflect on the memory that God has given us. What is it that we must remember about the Eucharist? Basically this, to the memory of the Eucharist is a memory of mercy. That we would not be able to celebrate the Eucharist separated from the gospel of mercy. I'd like to share with you an incident in the life of Santa Teresa de Jesus. The devil appeared to her disguised as the Lord. And because the devil was very successful in looking like Jesus, Teresa started a conversation. 
But in the course of the conversation, Teresa discerned that she was not talking to the Lord, that it was the devil. So she exclaimed, You are not my Lord. And then the devil said, Yes, I am not. But how did you recognize that I am not your Lord? And Teresa said, You have no wounds. My Lord has wounds. You are not my Lord. In other words, the wounds of Jesus are his identity. The wounds on his hands and his feet, on his side, these are the marks of the mercy of the Lord. You will not be able to understand the mystery of God's love unless you fully understand the mystery of God's mercy. The essence of the Lord is mercy. The heart of the Lord is mercy. And if we receive the body and blood of Christ in every Mass, it is not because we are worthy. It is not because we are special than the others. It is rather because in our misery, God has shown us His mercy. Brothers and sisters, as we reflect on the memory of mercy and we are reminded that the essence of God is mercy, I ask you now, where are your wounds? Have your wounds made you more revengeful? Have your wounds made you more angry? Have your wounds made you more cynical? The fruit of mercy is faith. Faith in the power of love. Faith in the power of conversion. Faith in the power of people touched by the Lord and then changing to follow the Lord. The essence of God's heart is mercy. That heart has been wounded and yet that heart continues to love. At the sunset of our lives, it will not be a beauty contest of the most flawless. It will not be a beauty contest of the most beautiful. You know what makes you beautiful? Wounds. Scars. Wounds and scars born by love, born for love, born with love. These scars, these wounds make us beautiful because they show that we are disciples of the Lord. Some will say, a good Catholic attends Mass, the real presence. Some will say, the good Catholic is devoted to the Mother of God. Some will say, the good Catholic works for justice and peace and the liberation of men and women oppressed. Some will say, the good Catholic is a mystic, a contemplative in the midst of the world. All of these are signs of a good Catholic. And the Eucharist, the cross, the Virgin Mary are signs of a good Catholic. But if you will ask me, what is the one sign that makes us good Catholics? I will say, it is love of enemies. Loving our enemies is the mark of a good Catholic Christian. And please be reminded, my dear brothers and sisters, that when we worship the Lord, the Lord expresses His love for us by looking at us with mercy. We are enemies of the Lord with the sins we have done. We are enemies of goodness with the commandments we have violated. Really, we are enemies of God. But instead of treating us as enemies, instead of treating us as slaves, He has called us His friends. That transformation from being an enemy to being a disciple to being a friend, this is all purely God's mercy. The Eucharist invites us do this in memory of me. And what is the memory that God has entrusted to us 
At Calvary, he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. At the upper room in the first Eucharist, the Lord said, Do this in memory of me. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Because there is no greater love than to die for your friends. The memory of mercy challenges us to love our enemies. At the core of the Eucharist is the challenge, love your enemies. That is your identity. I am fascinated by a special kind of tree that grows in India and Japan. It is called sandalwood. It looks like an ordinary tree with a huge trunk with leaves. But something is strange with the sandalwood. When you hit the sandalwood with an axe, the axe that hurts the tree becomes fragrant. When you hit the sandalwood with a knife and engrave some letters on the mark, the knife becomes fragrant. In other words, the sandalwood leaves a fragrance on the axe that hurts it. We all need mercy because we all have sinned. We are like axes and knives who have hurt the sandalwood and the name of that sandalwood is Christ. We all need mercy. But not only did the Lord give us mercy, the Lord gave us the power to share that mercy with others. What a beautiful story of God's mercy. That we are not only recipients, we have been empowered to forgive. We have been empowered to share that mercy. That is the essence of the Eucharist. The Eucharist is not only a bread of mercy for ourselves. The Eucharist is bread of mercy meant to be shared because everybody needs mercy. In approaching the table of the Lord, let us keep in mind that the Eucharist is not the reward for the righteous. The Eucharist is not a reward for the holy and the obedient. The Eucharist is remedy for sin. We are miserable sinners and we are met by the mercy of the Lord. Sandalwood. This is the mystery of God's mercy. Leaving a fragrance on the axe that hurts it. Leaving a fragrance on the sinner who has hurt the Lord. And not only leaving a fragrance, empowering that sinner to become a forgiver, to become an instrument of mercy for his brothers and sisters. Can we understand that? Can we appreciate that? That everybody needs mercy. If you cannot understand that everybody needs mercy and you think that in receiving the Eucharist, you are able to prove that you are most deserving, please be reminded of the words before Holy Communion. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. The fruit of mercy is joy. Our generation has faced much depression, much loneliness. We have linked up with one another because of social media, because of the internet, because of the cyberspace. But even if we are linked to one another in split seconds, there is depression. Why? Because the internet, the cyberspace, does not have the capacity to give us peace and love. Only human beings can give us peace. And human beings can share love. Our world is looking for meaning. It is looking for purpose. 
it is not just the pandemic of a virus. It is the pandemic of depression, the pandemic of loneliness, the pandemic of sadness, even if we are affluent, the pandemic of being isolated, even if we are linked with so many friends on mass media, on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, and so on. My dear brothers and sisters, the Eucharist reminds us that it is mercy that we are lacking. That is why we have no joy. If you have never accepted the fact that you are in need of mercy, then you will not have any celebration whatsoever. And having no celebration whatsoever that enters your soul, that comes from your soul, then understandably, depression and loneliness and sadness and feelings of isolation will take over us. The Eucharist is real presence. I will be with you until the end of time. The Eucharist declares to us, I will always be with you. And it is this presence that is the cure, the antidote to the loneliness, to the depression that this world is going through. Unfortunately, we have also become comfortable with our live stream masses, with our online celebrations. These are good at a time of emergency, but there can be no real Christianity without celebrating the real presence of the Lord. And we need community in order to be truly human. The Eucharist invites us, share, share that mercy, because sharing that mercy, you will discover the joy that you are looking for. Uh, now we are going to listen to the response song from our classmate, Dr. Elinda Gatdula Absedi. Longing for light, we wait in darkness. Longing for truth, we turn to you. Make us sure your holy people, light for the world to see.
Thank you, Linda. Again, in the life of St. Teresa, she came down one morning from the cloister and saw a little boy playing in the garden. She was surprised because they have no children in the convent. So, smiling, St. Teresa of Jesus said to the boy, Good morning. I am Teresa of Jesus. What is your name? And the little boy responded, I am Jesus of Teresa. It was an apparition of the child Jesus. And the apparition wanted to declare to St. Teresa, You belong to me. I belong to you. That is love. We have different surnames, but actually, we have a common surname, family name. We are all of Jesus. And it is this belonging to Jesus that becomes our source of freedom. You do not belong to money. You do not belong to your work. You do not belong to what other people say. You do not belong to your mistakes and errors. You do not belong to your successes. More important than who are you is the question, to whom do you belong? And I belong to Jesus. And in the Eucharist, we celebrate that belongingness. And because we belong to Jesus, no matter what the world says to us, the rebukes, the calumnies, the gossips, the bashing that we go through in the world. Nothing can disturb us. You know why? Because I belong to God and that is all that matters. Mercy sets us free, but it is mercy that gives us real freedom. And that real freedom comes from the merciful God who has become ours and the merciful God to whom we all belong. Some people say, I am afraid to be merciful because I don't like to be perceived as weak. Mercy is not weakness because mercy gives us also a challenge to confront evil, to challenge conversion, invite a change of life, and then offer consolation. I offer you the confrontational message of the gospel. To confront is a 
gesture of mercy. To correct error is an act of mercy. And then to invite conversion is an act of mercy. Mercy is not tolerating evil. Mercy is not tolerating what is wrong. Mercy demands conversion because to confront evil, to challenge what is wrong, and to invite conversion for the wrongdoer is an act of mercy. The Eucharist is that. At the core of the Eucharist is consolation, yes. But the Eucharist is also there to disturb us. In a manner of speaking, the Eucharist is a double-edged sword. It brings consolation to those who are afflicted, but it brings affliction to those who are too comfortable. The Eucharist confronts us, and when the Eucharist confronts us with our wrongdoing, that is still the face of God's mercy wanting us to be better. Mercy is not weakness. In fact, only the strong can be merciful. In challenging one another to reform our lives, we actually give our loved ones that gift of mercy. I say it again, only the mighty and the strong can be merciful. God is almighty, God is strong and powerful because God is mercy challenging us to conversion. At every Eucharist, we pray the Lord's Prayer and say, Lord, may your kingdom come. And the coming of God's kingdom is a kingdom of mercy, justice, and peace. The kingdom of God belongs to those who are suffering, to the hungry, to the thirsty. The kingdom of God belongs to those who endure all things for Christ. Mercy is not just forgiveness and compassion. It is, but it is more than that. It is working for the coming of God's kingdom. And mercy is also the fulfillment of our work for justice. Mercy does not end with a feeling. Because mercy without the pursuit of justice would be weakness. But on the other hand, the pursuit of justice, not grounded on mercy, will just make us brutal dictators, authoritarian rulers who have no respect for human rights. The coming of God's kingdom is our reason for the Eucharist. The kingdom of justice, mercy, love, and peace. But keep in mind that the kingdom of God is where God's will is always done. There will be no mercy. There will be no joy. There will be no reign of God's kingdom for the disobedient. Because mercy is the fruit of obedience. And it is only by the virtue of obedience where the kingdom of God comes about. And then when the kingdom of God comes about, then it becomes a kingdom of mercy. May your will be done. May your kingdom come. It is a kingdom of mercy. And the will of God is mercy for all of us. Mercy to be shared with everybody. Mercy must be celebrated. A celebration not just of an individual person, but mercy must be celebrated as a community. You have been recipients of mercy in the Eucharist, but in the Eucharist, we celebrate as a community. You may be alone with the priest celebrating the Mass, but you are not alone because the Eucharist has power to change the entire cosmos. And when we say body of Christ, we do not only receive that piece of bread that is truly and really the body of Christ. When we say the body of Christ, we also say the body of Christ, which is God's church, the community of faithful coming together. That is the body of Christ also. So the Eucharist 
is not just the body of Christ. The Eucharist is the Christian community celebrating as a community. And that is the memory of mercy. Mercy must be celebrated. And the mark of the Christian community is that we are a community of God's mercy. You need community for mercy. And the community cannot thrive without merciful members. The spirit of community life is mercy. It is not just fun. It is not just fellowship. It is not just having a picnic together. Because it is when we share that mercy with one another, when we know that we are sinners together, we are wicked together, and we are all recipients of God's mercy together, then our community is stronger because we are not just bound by fun. We are not just bound by pleasure. We are bound by our common sinfulness and by the, by the mercy of God that we all have received from the Lord. Mercy must be celebrated. Mercy needs community. And the community needs mercy. At the Eucharist, we present our gifts. And the gifts presented in every Eucharist have an ancient tradition of being shared with the poor, the orphans, and the widows and strangers. At the core of the presentation of gifts, which sometimes we call offertory, is the reality that the poor have a special place in our hearts. I am told by our liturgy experts that even that small gesture of putting a drop of water into the wine is actually a reminder for us of the poor. Because in ancient times, the poor made offerings to the altar and sometimes they could be poor wine, not sweet, sometimes sour. So water is poured into it in order to dilute the poor taste of the wine. So the droplet of water is actually a reminder of the offerings of the poor. Our society exalts affluence and wealth and success. But people say, I did not steal, I did not kill, I did not lie, I got my wealth from honest labor. True. And then you enjoy it? True. And only you? No. Because in every wealth, in every blessing that the Lord gives you, the question to ask is, where are they? And they means the poor. It is the poor who will be our pathway to heaven. And the Eucharist is actually bread of the poor. The Eucharist invites us to look for the strangers, for the orphans, the widows, those who have less in life must have the greater part of God's blessings. The Eucharist is a gift of mercy. Remember, before the Lord, we are all poor. Remember how poor you are and share what you have received with those around you. We are all poor in the sight of the Lord. The Eucharist is not a symbol, it is real presence, hidden under the appearance of bread and wine. The Lord is invisible, and yet we can touch the Lord. We can touch the Lord, we can taste the Lord, because the food and the drink that we take is the Lord Himself. The Lord is invisible. And true humility is invisibility. And true mercy is humility. 
what I'm trying to say, my dear brothers and sisters, is this. That the Eucharist is the invisible God allowing Himself to be touched, to be tasted by human beings. And when God, who is invisible, allows Himself to be touched, and when God, who is invisible, mandates us to this in memory of me, wash one another's feet, then that invisibility is an invitation for mercy and humility. To be invisible is to be humble. And to be humble is to be merciful. The proud cannot be merciful. Only the humble can show mercy. Because the humble, touched by the Lord, who stoops down to wash His disciples' feet, is the same Lord who will give meaning and purpose to our lives. Be invisible, be humble. That is the final mandate of our celebration of the Eucharist. Do this in memory of me. In memory of God's mercy. The memory of the Eucharist is a memory of mercy. We thank the Lord for memory. We praise the Lord for His mercy. For the closing prayer, may I call on our classmate, Dr. Cesar Maki Makapagal. Sisters and brothers, we are still in the presence of the Lord. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty Father, blessed be your holy name. We believe, we adore, and we love you, dearest Father. Thank you for your faithfulness, love, and mercy. Father God, we are grateful for gathering us today that allowed us to listen to your words. Thank you for re your real presence in the Eucharist that lead us to conversion and holiness. Dear Lord, grant us the grace of true repentance and also teach us to forgive. Empower us sinners to share this mercy to others as you are merciful God. Heavenly Father, hear and answer our prayers for our classmates, classmates, relatives, and friends who are in need of healing of their afflictions. Let them experience the healing power of your love and mercy. For our classmates, classmates, relatives, and friends who have gone before us, dear Lord, bring them into the light of your presence. Grant them eternal rest. We pray for world peace, especially in Ukraine and the end of the pandemic. May we have a blessed day as we end this recollection, and Lord, please preserve us as we rest tonight. We ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Heavenly Father, may your will be done. May your kingdom come. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yeah.
touch you and be healed. Gather all your people and hold them to your heart. We remember how you love us through your death, and still we celebrate. Thank you very much. That is the recollection. The only request of Archbishop Sok is for us to hear Mass on site, which means that face to face. Please go to your favorite churches or to your parishes and uh, reflect. Hopefully, you can reflect on the Lenten recollection that we have uh, this morning, this evening, or this afternoon. Sa inyong and um, this is an answered prayer. Your presence really is an answered prayer of Chito's uh, uh, prayer intercession, Kanina. We would like to welcome all those who may be visiting St. Mary's who are new to the parish community. This Mass is being offered for the intentions of the UST Medicine Class 1974 for today's Lenten Recollection. <laughs> 